Good morning, my sisters and brothers in Christ. Once again, the Lord has allowed us to see a new day and to share in this moment. Again, our theme for this quarter is partners in a new creation. We began this study in the book of Isaiah. For the month of July, our focus will be in the Gospel of John under the second unit, the word, the agent of creation. Today's topic is the word heals. Our scripture text is John chapter 4. Verses 46 through 54, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, creator of heaven and earth, thank you for another day's journey. Thank you for loving us so much that you came in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, and died on the cross for our sins, that we might have life and more abundant life. It is only in you that we live, move, and have our being. As we enter into this period of study, please prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word. Speak to us, Lord. Give clarity and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As noted in our previous study, most scholars agree that the Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John between AD 90 and 100, much later than the other Gospels, and was therefore dealing with different circumstances, the threats of persecution and the heresy of Gnosticism. The Gospel of John is unique because of the four Gospels, only John begins with the preexistence of Jesus. Chapter 1 introduces us to the word, the logos, which is Greek for word or message. The first creative action of God was to speak, and the creative word functioned as the action which brought all things into being. Thus, all things came into being through the already existing word which God spoke at creation. The word ordered all things in creation and human affairs, and there is nothing that came into existence without him. John chapter 1 verse 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The word gives light, life and light that is illumination to humanity. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. The gospel of John is also unique in comparison to Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke referred to as the synoptic gospels because they record many of the same events in the life of Jesus, similar in sequence and sometimes with the same wording. However, John has no account of Jesus' birth, of his baptism. Um, we only have the record where John states that he, he testifies that he saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. John does not have an account of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. It tells nothing of the institution of the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion during the Last Supper, and no record of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. There is no record of the healing of any people possessed of devils or evil spirits. John does not include any of the parables. Instead, John includes miracles, events, and conversations that were omitted in the other Gospels. John selected seven miracles referred to as signs of power to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The seven miracles are turning water into wine, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The healing of the official son, which is today's lesson, chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. The healing at the pool of Bethesda, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. The feeding of the 5,000, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Walking on the water, chapter 6, verses 16 through 25. This is also recorded in Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Healing the man born blind, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. The raising of Lazarus from the dead, chapter 11, verses 1 through 44. John explains in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. According to John, after Jesus called his first disciples at the Jordan River, he began his ministry in Galilee. As previously stated, Jesus' first miraculous sign is recorded in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. A wedding feast was held at Cana of Galilee, a small village about 22 miles from the Jordan River, and Jesus was invited to attend with his disciples. During the course of the celebration, the wine supply ran out. Mary approached her son Jesus and said, They have no wine. He answered, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. 
Now, Mary heard Jesus' rebuke, but she still turned to the servants and said, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. Jesus honored Mary's faith, as uh, even though the time had not come for him to reveal his divinity. He directed the servants to fill six large stone pots with water and then commanded them to draw out some of the water and serve it to the governor at the feast. At some point between the filling and the drawing out of the stone pots, Jesus miraculously changed the water into a high quality wine, which the governor acknowledged. Chapter 2 verse 11 states, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. When Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Look at uh, chapter two, verses 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that they should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. In other words, Jesus did, he knew their hearts. He knew that their faith was shallow and sincere and superficial. In contrast, on his way back to Galilee, a whole Samaritan town put their faith in Jesus, not because of signs, but because of his word. In chapter four, verses one through 29, it was a, it was a Samaritan woman's testimony that caused the people of the city to come out to see Jesus. Here we see a faith emerging, not merely based on visible signs, but a faith dependent on the word of Jesus. Verse 29 in chapter four, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Now look at verses 39 and 40. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two days. But also look at verses 41 and 42. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. Of the world. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 1, describes faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the evidence or conviction that the unseen is real and exists. It then acts on those unseen things as if they are visible. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Also look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word by the word of God. That means that faith begins with the knowledge of God. So then faith is complete trust, confidence and reliance in God. It is taking God at his word, accepting his word as fact and acting accordingly. This is the nature of true faith. True faith is not based on sight, but on the word of God. Today's text is the second miracle recorded in John. And in this miracle, we see the progression or the stages of faith from a beginning faith to a tested and strengthened faith to a rewarded faith. As we get into our lesson, John chapter four, verse 45 tells us that the, uh, the Galileans welcomed Jesus, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. Let's get into our text, chapter 4, verses 46 and 47. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. When Jesus returned to Cana of Galilee, where he previously turned the water into wine, he encountered a nobleman, that is an official in the king's court, with an urgent immediate need. His son was sick to the point of death at Capernaum, which was 20 miles away. Here we see the man had a desperate need. The man's son was at the point of death. 
Unfortunately, it often takes a desperate need for many to come to the Lord. We come to him when we are in a crisis. It can be due to illness, death, disease, suffering, the consequences of living in a, a fallen world, any of the vicissitudes of life that are beyond our control. Now, the text doesn't indicate whether the man was a Jew or not. If he was a Jew, then maybe he had been to Jerusalem and seen the miracles Jesus performed. We're not told, but somehow this prominent man had heard about Jesus' miraculous power. And when he heard that Jesus was back in the region, he actively sought him out, finding him, finally finding him at Canaan, and begged Jesus to accompany him back to Capernaum to heal his gravely ill son. The man heard about Jesus, he had a need, he heard about Jesus, and set out to seek him. Note the things he had to go through. He had to leave his dying son. He traveled 20 miles to find Jesus. He swallowed his pride and publicly confessed his need. No position or custom stopped him from bringing his need to Christ. If we want the help that Christ can give, we must be humble enough to swallow our pride, our arrogance, get rid of those egos, and not care what anyone says. Verse 48. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Although Jesus was speaking to the official, his criticism was not only intended for the man, but also for those around him. They followed Jesus for the miracles he performed, but they didn't understand that they should seek him because of who he was, the Messiah, the Lord. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will never believe. This is a reflection of the attitude that people that had to see the evidence before they would believe Jesus. They were insincere and shallow. This man wasn't coming as a sinner seeking forgiveness and eternal, eternal life. He came to Jesus because he desperately needed help. There was the need of a physical healing, but there was also a greater need of spiritual healing. Signs were given to open us up to experience something greater. They were given so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that we might have eternal life. Remember, the Samaritans believed Jesus without any signs, except for him uh, revealing the woman's sin. They confessed Jesus Christ to be uh, Jesus to be the Christ because of his word. Faith in Jesus' word alone is enough. That's the lesson here. Verse 49, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. The man was persistent. He was not discouraged by Jesus' rebuke. This was a test. Now at this point, the man's faith was limited. He believed Jesus to be uh, had to be physically present to heal his son. It never occurred to him that Jesus could heal his son with just a word. God is not limited to our preconceived notions. He has infinite power. He is not limited by time, space, or distance. Now, although his faith was limited, it was a sincere faith. He desperately cried out, Sir, come down before my child dies. He felt that Jesus was his only hope. Now, I want you to note here, the fact that this man repeated his request to Jesus teaches us that we must be persistent with our petitions to the Lord. When we are persistent, the Lord will reward us with answers that glorify him. In other words, don't stop praying until you receive the assurance that God has heard and answered your prayer according to his will. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Continuing in verse 50. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Jesus heard the man, and he responded with compassion, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Note Jesus answered the man's request to heal his son, but he didn't go down to his house. He didn't do what the man expected him to do. We must put aside our expectations of how we want Jesus to work and just take him at his word. Remember the story of Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army who had leprosy that's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 19. Naaman's young Jewish servant told him the prophet Elijah could cure him 
of his leprosy. He was so desperate, he put together a, a nice reward and went to the prophet's house. He expected Elijah to come out and call on the Lord, wave his hands all over him and heal him. But Elijah didn't even come out of the house. Instead, he sent his servant out with instructions to wash in the Jordan River seven times and he would be healed. Well, Naaman was upset because it wasn't what he expected. He said, the rivers in Syria, why did I even leave home? We have water in Syria and they're better than this muddy Jordan. So he went away angry. Now, after the servant girl talked to Naaman, he went back, followed Elijah's instructions and was healed and believed in the Lord. It may not come he may not do it the way we expect. He may not give us the instructions or heal us the way we expect, but we have to put aside these preconceived notions and expectations and just take God at his word. Our blessings begin at the point of obedience. In a bold act of faith, this desperate father believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and proved it by going his way. He left without receiving a sign. Jesus didn't engage in any long conversation on faith with the man. He didn't ask him if he believed. The only response needed was for the man to obey Jesus' directive to go. This is a deeper level of faith, faith in Jesus' word. Continuing in verses 51 and 52. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy, sir, thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. He didn't receive the confirmation of healing until the next day. Just imagine this man as he returned home being met by his servants running, excited with the good news, Thy son liveth. After he heard the wonderful news that his son was alive, he asked about the time his son recovered. The seventh hour, that is two o'clock in the afternoon, and he realized it was the very hour that Jesus spoke the words. When Jesus spoke, the child was immediately healed. Continuing in verses 53 and 54. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Let's stop right there. At this point, the nobleman entered into a deeper, deeper faith in Christ. His faith grew from a beginning faith when he came to Jesus out of a crisis to a stronger faith of taking Jesus at his word to a mature faith in Jesus for who he is, the Christ, the Son of God. The man was saved and as a result of the man's testimony, his entire household was saved. Verse 54. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea and to Galilee. What about you? Are you growing in the area of faith? Do you believe God's word? Does your faith lead to obedience? Does your faith lead to witnessing and evangelizing? That concludes our lesson. Until next time, may God bless and keep you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.